Hey, good morning, Four Winds family. It's Pastor Joel here, and we want to welcome you to this morning's online service. And we've been talking about character. If you've uh, not been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know we finished up our series through the book of Acts. You can check out all those messages on our YouTube channel. By the way, we put them all in a playlist, and so you can go back and, and revisit that if you want. But we're in a new series on character. And a couple weeks ago, we just kind of laid out a foundation, just talked about character in its most general sense. And then last week, we looked at a character shaped. This morning, we're going to look at what happens when our character gets shaken. And so we're going to be looking at character again today. So find your Bibles, because what we're doing is we're looking at who we really are on the inside. That's, that's what this study is all about. We're looking at who we really are on the inside. What do we do when we think no one's watching? You know, where, where do we go when we're not putting on an act? We're not putting on a show. Where do I go when I'm not putting on a show? for the benefit of other people. That's what we're looking at in this series. And to do this, there's, there's so many different characters that we could use as our test subject in the Bible, but we're using the test subject of the person named Joseph. And so we're going to be looking at Joseph's story in Genesis. So if you got a Bible, turn to Genesis 37. We're going to be picking up right where we left off from last week. Now, before we get into the Word, I think it's always important that we open with prayer, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to convince us of what is true. You know, we see that in John chapter 16. Jesus said, it's your benefit that I go away because when the Holy Spirit comes in a whole new dimension in your life, you know, he's going to be able to convince you of what is really true. And I think when it comes to character development, we really need to know, well, what is really true? So let's ask Holy Spirit to speak to us. Can we do that? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just want to put away all distractions all interferences, anything that can get in the way, Lord, we want to just tune our hearts to you for the next hour. We ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you give us understanding of your word and of your ways. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Convince us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would convince us of what is true, where we need to shift, where we need to be reshaped, molded and sculpted into your image on the inside. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at the life of Joseph this morning. We're going to use him as our test subject, as I said, for discovery. What does the Bible say about character and what does he want to do in our life today? You know, we see the need to develop our character. And if, if you haven't seen the need yet, there was four questions I asked at the very end of the first message in this series. We asked it at the very beginning of last week's message. I'm just going to throw out one question here, okay? One of the four, the one that gets me, right? Go to uh, the Bible in uh, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, okay? 1 Corinthians 13, it's known as the love chapter, right? It's what the Bible really breaks down. Love is this, you know, and 1 John tells us God is the personification of love. Love is who he is. Okay, so if you look at 1 Corinthians 13 and you put God in place of love, God is patient, God is kind, God is not easily provoked. It, it all rings true. But can you insert your name in place of the word love? As you do that, the areas that feel uncomfortable, oh, that's not really true of me. I wish it was true, but it's not. It shows you the need for character development. So we see the need, but how do we get there? You know, I, I like to look at people who got there in life, that, that achieved something, that, that reached a certain level. I like to look at people who got there, and I want to see how did they do it. You know, we look at YouTube videos, and we see how somebody does a project, a do-it-yourself project, or some kind of maintenance chore. How did they accomplish that? How did they get there? That's really what we want to look at in this series. So this series is going to challenge us to grow in our character. Two weeks ago, the message was all about taking off the mask. Who am I really on the inside? So let's look at our character for what it really is. And then last week, we got rid of excuses. Because excuses artificially limit our growth. You know, Joseph came from a dysfunctional home. We broke that down last week. His brothers hated him. So you can't blame character on, on how he was treated or the environment in which he, was live, which he lived in. Those things should have been able to shape his character in a negative way, but they didn't. That tells me something. That tells me I can come from these kind of backgrounds. I can have these kind of things happen to me in life and still 
I can become a person of Christ-like character. So that gives us hope. I think that's something that, that's meant to cause us to lift our eyes up above from where we're at and say, hey, you know what? I can grow. Let's throw away the excuses that have kept us stuck where we are. So nevertheless was our big word last week. This might be true, but it's never the less true than this fact. God can shape our character. It doesn't matter what background we came from. So we looked at all that last week, and so we're going to pick things up. We're going to reread some of the passage from last week, but we're going to get through the whole chapter this morning. So Genesis 37, verse 3. Now Israel, and that's another name for Jacob. Remember, it's the same person. Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic, or some of your Bibles might say a coat of many colors. Hold that thought. We're going to come back and talk about that in a moment. That's why I wanted to reread this section. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please, listen to this dream which I had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. That's, you know, if you want to put it in a modern day context, that's kind of like bailing hay is for us today. Okay, if you're on a farm or ranch or something, when they gather in the hay and they, they get the baling machines out and they, they bale up hay, uh, that's, that's kind of what they're talking about. Now, they did everything by hand. They didn't have machinery to help them do this stuff, so they did everything by hand. But when they would cut the wheat, they would have these, these bundles of wheat stalks and they would just all pile them up. And what he's saying is, my sheaf, my bundle of cut grain stood erect and all of your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. So it's, it's kind of like saying we were out baling hay and my hay bale stood upright and all of yours came around and bowed down to my hay bale. And so his brothers, you know, it didn't take a genius to figure out, you know, what this dream uh, seemed to be signifying. His brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are, are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream because every matter is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Biblically speaking, God always confirms himself with two or three witnesses. So here's another dream, and he related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now at this time, he had eleven other siblings, ten brothers and his sister Dinah. Now it could be, we're not exactly sure of the timeline here. It's possible that Benjamin may have been born when this happened. So I allow for the possibility of that. Now, if that is true, then he, then the sun and the moon, that represents Jacob and uh, Joseph's mother. But if Benjamin is one of the stars because Rachel died in, in labor, uh, then the, uh, the moon in that case would have been his stepmother. So he related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother, possibly stepmother, and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. And so that's what uh, we went through last week. So we already looked at this part of the story, but there's a detail here that I wanted to look at before we go on. We didn't have time to address this really last week in detail, but it says that Jacob made his son Joseph a very colored or a, a coat of many colors, a very colored tunic or a coat of many colors. And so the coat of many colors seems to be the, the most common way in which this is remembered, even if it may not be translated that way in all of the translations. Something to that effect is what appears in our Bible. It's difficult from the Hebrew to understand with any certainty, what the writer means here. When Moses uses this terminology and he writes this, what does he mean here? It's difficult with certainty to know what's meant. This is a fairly obscure Hebrew word that's used here. This is an uncommon word in the Old Testament in the sense that it's only used in this passage and in one other place. And so if we look at those two places, maybe collectively we can get a better understanding of what this is about. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 18 to 19, we find that King David's virgin daughters, they were given and they wore, so David had them, uh, he had them given these, these outer garments, and most of our Bibles refer to these garments, these special garments, as long-sleeved 
garments. So why the same word is translated long sleeved in 2 Samuel chapter 13 uh, versus coat of many colors in Genesis 37, there's a lot of debate on this and, and it's impossible to know with certainty what exactly this is. But here's the key is, is not so much what it was, but what it meant to the user, to the wearer, okay? What was this apparel really about? It, it seems that uh, this distinguished David, King David's virgin daughters, they were distinguished as being virgin daughters of the king, okay? So there's, there may have been a, a um, connotation of purity that was associated with this particular piece of clothing. And so this tunic, as, as my Bible calls it, this tunic seems to be more than just a piece of apparel. It's more than just decorative, in other words. It, whatever this was, it distinguished him. I think that this is really the essence. It distinguished him from his brothers. And so to his father, it may have been a symbol. To his father, it might have been like, you are a really special person on the inside. I want to decorate you on the outside with this. Okay, so it may, it may have, that's what it probably signified to Jacob when he gave it to him. To Joseph's jealous brothers, however, it may have been interpreted as an intention on the part of their father to supplant them to make Joseph the ruler of the family after he died. And so this really, really gets under the, uh, the skin of Joseph's brothers. Now keep this in mind because this is not a trivial uh thing, it's going to come up. It's going to be a big deal here later on in the passage. So I, I wanted to go back and revisit what this coat of many colors or this very colored tunic was all about before we went any further, because it's going to show up at the end of the story this morning. All right, let's continue on. Verse 12, then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Now look at what it says in verse 14. He said to him, go and see about the welfare. Say welfare. He said, go and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring back word to me. I'd, I'd mark that. That's, that's the mission that Jacob sent his son on. You need to keep that in mind. He's not sending them out. I want you to check on these guys and, and, and report back to me the evil that they're doing. No, he, he said, look after their welfare. He, he had Joseph on a mission to make sure that the brothers were okay. Do you need anything? He's looking out for them. And so he sent, them from, sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. This is not a, uh, an insignificant journey either. This is about a 50-mile overland journey as the crow flies. And a man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they're pasturing the flock. And the man said, They've moved on from here. I heard them say, Let us go on to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So he sent on this mission here. I just want to pause for a moment before we get into the, the rest of the message here, because I want you to see how Joseph demonstrates a willingness to serve. So we see Joseph, he's, he's, got, he's become this person of character, and he's been raised to know and follow God. He's been taught right from wrong by his father. Remember, his father had some serious changes that took place in his life. Jacob began to take God more seriously. We see this significant change in Jacob's life and in Jacob's character in Genesis 35. But the older boys... It's like they don't really follow dad when he starts to make these shifts in his, uh, his values and in his morals. But Joseph is very moldable. He's very young when this happens, so he's, he's much more able to receive this. We talked about this all last week. But I want you to see how Joseph has this willingness to serve because it's one more way in which our character is shaped. Last week, week we looked at four things that can shape our character, four keys about our, how our character can be shaped or not shaped depending on the, uh, on the context. But I want to show one more way in which character can be shaped here, because we see in this section Joseph is serving his father, he's serving his brothers, we see him willingly working to benefit the people that he knows hate and despise him. His brothers don't make any secret about it, right? They could not speak to him on peaceable terms. They couldn't speak to him on friendly terms. 
And so the key here I want you to take away from this is that character is shaped when we serve. Say that a lot. Say character is shaped when I serve. This is why it's so important to get involved, not just casually attend church once a month, maybe, not to show up, you know, an hour late. Ah, let's see what this guy's got to say. Uh, I'm feeling kind of guilty. Maybe I'll, I'll feel better about myself because I went to church this week. Character gets shaped when we serve. Get involved in your local church. Well, I don't know how I can get involved. Step up and ask. There's so many ways that you can get involved in your local church. Character is shaped when we serve. And you know what? The more you serve, the more, the more that uh, uh, you're going to find opportunity for your gifts and your talents to get drawn out of you. You know, our life is kind of like a seed in a way. Everything that a seed needs to become, everything it's meant to become, a tree, a forest of trees, really. Everything is that, that, that seed can become, it's packed away into it, but nothing will happen with it unless it gets planted in the right kind of environment. You see, if you sit that seed on the counter, it's not going to turn into a pine tree. If you put that seed on, you know, on the sofa, it's not going to turn into an apple tree. But if you put that seed in the environment that it needs to be in to grow into what it's meant to be, you'll see it produce. I believe we get our lives, you know, if we plant ourselves, get planted in the house of God, our character gets shaped when we serve. There's going to be things in us that we didn't know was in us that will get drawn out. As God sees you serve and, and says, you know what, I believe I can trust him with more, starts to unlock more things in your life. This is something that a lot of Christians are missing out on. Character is shaped when we serve. Get involved in your local church and watch what God does in your character development. It's not just a show. It's not an act. Oh, I want to be on stage. No, serve isn't about being part of an act or part of the show. You know, when we serve, it's in the environment that character is not only shaped, but it grows. A lot of the service happens behind the scenes. It's not something that's uh, uh, done for the benefit of other people to see and, and, and look at and, and for you to get attention. It's about you putting yourself in an environment where God, what God has put inside of you can be developed, not just so it's sculpted and shaped, but that it actually grows into something. So much more I could say on that, but we need to move on. Verse 18, when they saw him from a distance, now something changes here from verse 18 onwards. I'll talk about the very end of it, but I want you to be sensitive to, to something here. That the, the tone of the, the chapter starts to get really dark now. When they, the brothers, saw him, Joseph, from a distance, before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Literally in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is more expressive here. It says a lot more than just that. They're saying, here comes this master of dreams, or here comes this one who in his dreams thinks he's going to become the master over us. Now, come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits. These, these, uh, they were either like caves in the ground, or they were like dried up wells or cisterns that collected rainwater. We'll throw him into one of the pits and we'll say a wild beast devoured him. There was lions, bears, leopards. There's all kind of predatory animals in the land of Canaan at this time. We'll say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. They wanted to cancel Joseph's future. So when they say, come, let us kill him, and we'll just throw his body away like it's a piece of trash, right? When they say that, remember, these guys already are killers. You know, you go back to Genesis 34, they massacred an entire village way over the top. That was the event that shocked Jacob into realizing, hey, I need to make some changes in my own character. What kind of sons am I raising? These guys are already killers. So, you know, this isn't really idle talk on their part. Their animosity towards Joseph, it seems like it's fixated on Joseph's future, the prophetic dreams that he had. There's something about those that... The brothers had a sense there's something about this that, that might ring true, and it bothered them. And so their animosity is directed towards Joseph because of these dreams. It just intensifies. And these hyper-competitive guys, they don't want to be ruled over by this Joseph fellow. Now, this is more than a clash of personalities. It's not just, you know, we don't like his personality. It was a clash of character. 
There's some people that will despise someone else because that other person does the right thing. They're committed to doing the right thing. They'll talk about them derogatory. Oh, you're just such a Boy Scout. It's a clash of character that's taking place here. And so they're trying to cancel his future. Joseph's committed to doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And that rubs Joseph's brothers the wrong way. Now, at this point, I want to pause just for a second here because I, I mentioned it last week how Joseph is a major type, a prophetic model of what Jesus Christ was going to be. And it's interesting. You see people in the Old Testament, their lives can become prophetic of who Jesus would be. You and I today can have the character of God produced inside of us so that we give a reflection of who Jesus Christ is. It's like we're, we're doing the same thing, but from a different perspective. But what really grabs me and motivates me and challenges me all at the same time is how this guy becomes this person of incredible Christ-like character. And his life is a prophetic picture of who Jesus would be thousands of years before Jesus would come to be Jesus, Mary's boy on the earth. So I want to pause for a second here and just show some of the examples in which the Bible anticipates Jesus Christ through the life of this guy, Joseph. Seven ways. Number one, he was hated without a cause. There's, there's really no reason for the brothers to hate Joseph. He's not done anything wrong to them. And we see the th same thing about Jesus. Joseph brought back a bad report of his brothers to the father. And we see Jesus kind of on the same sort of a mission here. You know, he was sent to his own. They received him not. He comes back to the father with a report about his brethren. And, uh, and so number three, he was loved by his father. That's, that's a big, big deal. You know, before Jesus goes in the showdown in the desert with, with uh, Satan and the great temptation, uh, he is loved by his Father. What sustains him in that time of temptation is the reality. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so this relationship between Jacob and Joseph, it's kind of a model of the relationship between Father God and Jesus. Number four, Joseph wore a distinguishing outer garment. So I, 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 that's another reason why I wanted to highlight that. You know, Je Jesus has this this peculiar garment. We're not told a whole lot about it, except that it was very valuable, apparently. Might, might have been the most valuable thing he actually owned, and that the soldiers gambled to uh, see which one of them were going to get that after it was stripped off of him at the crucifixion. And uh, Joseph was prophetically ordained to rule over his brothers. We see the same thing about Jesus. And number six, his brothers are jealous of him. And we know from the Gospels that it was jealousy, it was envy that motivated the, uh, the opponents of Jesus to take the extreme measures that they eventually took against him. And so we see the same kind of parallels here with Joseph's life. And uh, number seven here, he was sent by his father as a blessing to the brothers to look after their welfare. And we find Jesus was sent to his own, but they did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, there's always a remnant. God always has a remnant. As many as did receive them, to them he gave them the right or the power to become the children of God, to have the same character produced in the side of them. And so that's why we're talking about character here. We're going to look at seven more of these at the end of the message. I just wanted to kind of highlight some of them before we go on any further here. So let's continue the story. Verse 21, then Reuben... But Reuben, when he heard this, he heard this talk about, let's kill him. You know, they could see him coming at a distance. I don't think Joseph is quite there within earshot yet. But when Reuben heard this, he rescued him, re rescued Joseph out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, now Reuben's the oldest, okay? Reuben said to him, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that's in the wilderness, but don't lay hands on him. And he said that, apparently, that he might rescue him out of their hands later on to restore him to his father. Now, it sounds here like, hey, maybe not all these brothers are, you know, such bad guys. I mean, Reuben here seems to be wanting to do the right thing. His motivation seems, you know, to be geared in the right direction. And it looks righteous on the surface, but if you look more carefully and you go back a few chapters and understand a few things about some of the background... I see a much more self-serving motive. Now, I, I could be reading something wrong into this, so take it for what it's worth. But if you go back before this event, you find there's this episode that takes place right after Rachel dies. That sometime before this, Reuben tried to assert himself 
as the leader of the family. And he did that by having sexual relations with his father's concubine, Bilha. Now, it wasn't, I don't believe this was entirely a, like a lustful thing. This is more about a power grab. It's about Reuben saying, I want to be the leader of the tribe now. Dad, you're getting old. It's time for you to step down. It's time for some young blood to take over the family business. And so that's, I believe, what's really going on here in that tribal culture. But his attempt backfires. Jacob's going to live a lot longer. And, uh, and Reuben's way out in front of things here. Reuben ends up losing a lot of favor with his father. You know, he was here. He was the firstborn. Now he is several rungs down below. And you'll see more of that later on at the end of Jacob's life in Genesis 49. Reuben never recovers from that in his father's sight. Reuben's efforts here seem to be designed to regain what he lost. He wants to regain that lost favor and thereby reposition himself as the one who's going to succeed father when Jacob dies. He, Reuben wants to get himself back to the top of the dog pile, as it were. Verse 23, So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. And so in one moment, Joseph's life forever changes. This is a traumatic life event. Okay, nothing's ever going to be the same after this. This is a life-changing trauma that's inflicted upon him, and it's going to alter the trajectory of his life from this point onwards. So this is a major, major thing that's happening to his life, and it happens in an instant, in a moment. He doesn't see this coming. And so I thought it might be helpful to plot the trajectory of Joseph's life. And we want to give like an outline of Joseph's life from his childhood to old age. It kind of follows this sort of a course. He's born into a place of privilege. And we talked about that last week. He's born into a place of privilege, and his character is really shaped in those formative years. But now he's thrown into a pit. And so the big question we're going to be asking this morning is, is he going to be the same person in the pit that he was in the privilege? He's going to be thrown into the pit. He transitions from there, and he becomes another man's possession. He's sold into slavery and becomes another man's possession from there, he even reaches the lowest place in his life when he's abandoned in prison for something he didn't do. But from prison, from that lowest point, he, his life takes on a wholly unexpected turn when he's elevated from the prison to the palace. And from the palace, he is able to fulfill his purpose. And so we see that his, his, if, we, if we look at it like this, it's like, oh, this pit, it's not a big deal. But in that moment, you know, he, has, he doesn't see becoming another man's possession. He doesn't see, I'm going to be thrown in prison for something I didn't do. He doesn't see all of the mistreatment and the hardship that's down the road. This is a, a major transition from him. Up to this point, he's only ever known privilege. The only, you know, real adversity in his life is that his brothers, you know, don't treat him very well. And so they took him and they threw him into the pit, and Joseph is shifted from privilege to the pit. His challenge during this transition is, is he going to be the same person in that pit that he was when he was living in that place of privilege? My dad loves me. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I know that, uh, you know, he's, he's taught me right from wrong. And, and, and someday that I, I'm going to have an important destiny fulfilled. God showed me a glimpse of my future. You know, is he going to be that same person that right is right, wrong is wrong, and we're going to do the right thing? Is he going to be that same person in the pit that he was before he was thrown into the pit? Or is the pit going to change his character? Is the pit going to shape him? Or is he shaping the pit? This, this is the challenge now. And so his life is now going to go through a long season of testing. It says they stripped Joseph of his tunic that coat of many colors, the very color tunic that was on him. And so the question now is when who you are on the outside 
get stripped away. Maybe, maybe you're in a, pr- a place of privilege or a place of responsibility and things out of your control conspire against you and you really haven't done anything wrong, but all of a sudden you're removed from that position or you're removed from that job or there's layoffs. You lose that outer facade, that, uh, that outer persona gets stripped away by things that are outside of your control. What are people going to see underneath? Are you that same person that you were when you were in that place of power and privilege? Or are you going to reveal that you're really something other than that? The pit's going to test you. It's going to test what's really on the inside of you. Is Joseph the same person without the coat of many colors as he was when he wore it? In other words. So they stripped off what was decorating his outside. And I think that that's, that's a, a good visual to understand that there, there's going to be times in our life where we're going to go through a series of tests to find out what's really on the inside. It's not so much for God to see it. He already knows it's there. Sometimes we need to see it. Sometimes other people need to see it. Maybe, maybe I go through something to be a witness. Now, many years later, years and years later, the writer of Psalm 105, he's going to write a song and he's going to use a couple of stanzas in there to look back on the life of Joseph and summarize his life in just a couple of verses in this song. But it says something really useful. You know, we got a long ways to go before all of this plays out. But if you jump ahead, look at this commemorative series of verses about Joseph's life written years later. I think that we see some interesting details that are helpful for us. Uh, we see the, the, the process that he's about to go through. That process gets initiated when he moves from privilege to the pit. In Psalm 105, verse 17, it says that God sent a man before them. Speaking of Joseph's brothers. God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with shackles. He himself was laid in irons, like chains. Until, say until. I love that word until there. It's a gateway term, right? Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. God gave him this vision of his future. But now that word is going to be, it's going to be testing him, his character. Can, Can you be that person that I need you to be to fulfill the picture that I gave you? The word of the Lord tested him. So he's going to go through this series of tests. Eventually, it says, the king sent and released him. Speaking of the Pharaoh, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. And so he's he's going to go through this period of testing. It's going to be unfair. It's going to be painful. He's, he's going to be confined. He's going to have all of these limitations placed on his life for a season. But then those limitations are going to be removed so he can be who he was always meant to be. He made him lord over over his house. The Pharaoh's going to make him ruler over everything. Ruler over all his possessions to imprison his princes at will that he might teach his elders wisdom. At the end of the day, Joseph's brothers are going to benefit from the person that Joseph becomes. Joseph's actions are going to teach them wisdom, going to teach them something. Their, Their character is under development as well, but it's hardened into a place That's going to require a bit more work. And so Joseph's going to be instrumental in teaching them wisdom and shifting and shaping their character. And so in the meantime, I want us to know this. I got three keys this morning, and they're going to come really quickly now. Number one, your character will be tested. It's not a question of will it. It's a question of when. Your character will be tested. Are you going to be the same person in the test that you were in the place of privilege before you get thrown into that pit. Your character will be tested. You know, if I know I'm going to go through a test, you know, whether it's in school, I know there's going to be an exam. What are my weak points? So before that exam, I'm studying, I'm preparing for the test now before I'm in it. When do you prepare for a test? When when you go to the test? No, you got to prepare for the test before the test comes. Okay, so we are going to be tested. So let's find out what are the weak links in our character. 
if I'm put in a place of pressure, what is what is my inclination to do the wrong thing? And how can I begin to address that now before the real test comes? Your character is going to be tested. Are you going to be the same person in the pit that you were in privilege? You know, if you take a lock, a lock is basically a, a cylinder inside of a uh, of a socket, a min mini lock anywhere, and that, that cylinder is meant to turn, okay? But there's all these tumblers that keep that from turning unless when the key is put in, that key, when it is inserted into that slot, there it, it undergoes several tests. And if it passes all the tests, it adjusts those tumblers that keep that cylinder from turning. And so for a locked door to be opened, there is several tests that must be passed before that lock will unlock. And there's people, man, they, they, they're pushing on locked doors and they're saying, God, open up this door. And they're making declarations and they're prophesying that door, but they're not allowing their character to be shaped like that key. So when it's inserted into the lock, it passed the test. And when it passed the test, man, that thing will turn so easily. You don't have to lean into it. You don't have to, to, to apply all this energy and effort to it, once you pass the test, that thing will turn easily. God wants to do some work on our character. He wants to do some shaving and some shaping of our character so that like a key that's inserted into a lock, when it passes those tests, so you insert it, ah, it's not working yet. So that key shaper, he'll take that key out and he'll look at it again and he'll match it up to the mold. He'll say, oh, here it is. See, the, the original key, Jesus, he's like this, but you like this. So let's work on this area and then insert that key again. And now it passes that test and now that, that lock will begin to turn. It's a good visual to have. As the key is inserted, when it's cut properly and it properly shaped, it's going to pass all those tests, and then the door is going to open very easily. Joseph's character, it can't get him out of the pit. I do need to say this. His character can't get him out of the pit. But his character can be sustained unharmed through the trial of the pit. The pit doesn't need to shape his character. You know, they stripped off his, his coat of many colors. Was it the tunic that made Joseph? Or did Joseph make the tunic? Was the tunic special because Joseph was wearing it, in other words? Is he the same person after the tunic's been stripped away? Is the metaphoric question we're asking here. Verse 25, then they sat down to eat a meal. They just threw their brother in a hole in the ground, intending to kill him, and now let's go eat. That's the kind of character we're dealing with here. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming up from Gilead, from the north. And their camels were bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh. These are different substances, luxury goods, uh, that they're taking down to Egypt. And so they're on their way, bringing them down to Egypt. Verse 26, and Judah's got an idea. Circle that name Judah in your Bible. Okay, we'll come back to that at the end of the passage, but I want you to be aware of it. Judas said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? They're still thinking about we should kill him. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Hey, you know, let's not get our hands dirty with this. We sell him to these guys. We, you know, he's as good as dead and we can make some money at the same time. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. Midianite and Ishmaelite. Ishmaelite is kind of like a general term. Midianite is probably a more specific term, specifying the exact tribe of Ishmaelite-type people. So uh, these are probably uh, Arabs from northern Arabia, is, is the tribe that we're dealing with here at this time. And they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, or 20 pieces of silver. And they br thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. So Judah has this really practical idea here. It's a, it's a practical insight. You know, why not just sell him as a slave to this passing caravan, and that way he's as good as dead. You know, our problem is solved. He's out of our way. He's never going to seize the leadership of our family tribe. You know, he's as good as dead. Our hands are clean. We didn't kill him. And he's okay with that. And the, and the other brothers, they're, they're okay with that. But what they have done in effect here is they have stripped Joseph of not just his coat of many colors, not just that tunic, they stripped him of his inheritance. 
His brother's actions were meant to forever cancel his future. But here's a major point. I really want you to get this. They couldn't cancel his future because they couldn't cancel his character. That's so important to understand. If your character can survive the pit, your future is still intact. I don't care what's coming against your life right now. The pit will want to shape your character. And it can if you let it. There's people that will want to cancel your future. They simply, it's a, it's a conflict of character. There's people who want to cancel your future, but they can't cancel your future because they can't cancel your character. The only one that can allow your character to be canceled is you. And so our second key this morning is the only way your future can be canceled is if you allow your character to be misshaped. Joseph's life is not going to be defined by the pit. It's not going to be defined by the house he grew up in. It's not going to be defined by the pit. You know, he doesn't allow his character to be misshaped. His life's not defined by the pit. It only changes his life's trajectory. But as far as God's concerned, he's still on course. Yes, this happened to him. It was out of his control. He didn't, it wasn't his fault that this was done to him. It was wrong what was done to him, but it doesn't cancel his future because it doesn't cancel his character. Can your character survive the pit is what we're asking. The pit doesn't limit who he becomes because the pit doesn't shape his character. There's a lot of people whose future is being shifted because they've allowed their pit to misshape their character. Your character is going to be tested. What are you doing to prepare for the test? What are you doing to prepare your character? What You know where you're weak. What are you doing to shore up those? You know, if you know you got a weakness in a piece of battle equipment and you're about to go into battle the next day, wouldn't you make that a priority to address those weaknesses? What's the weak points in your character? I've already showed you four ways that you could test your character and find out where do I need to go, where are the weak points at, what are you going to do about it? It's not going to just happen, you continuing to do all... If, if all you do is what you've been doing, you're not going to change. You're just going to keep being who you are. And God's calling you to be someone that's on a trajectory that's moving to be more like Him. An upward trajectory. If you're coasting through life, you're already going downhill. Okay? The pit doesn't limit who He becomes because the pit can't shape His character. So how about you? I don't know what kind of pit you've been thrown into in your life, but that pit doesn't have to limit who you become. The only way your future gets misshaped and canceled is if your character gets misshaped and canceled. Key number three, the value that others place on your life does not need to shape your character. Well, other people, they don't, just re they don't even recognize me. They devalue me, my family, and they treat me like this. Your Life is not defined by that. The value that other people place on your life does not need to shape your character. What value did they place, did the Joseph's brothers place upon his life? That did not shape his character. And that's really a good question to ask. You know, it says they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Okay. What value did the, did the brothers place on Joseph's life? I'll give you a hint. It's a trick question. All right, it's not as easy maybe as it looks here. They sold him for 20 shekels of silver, but hold on a second. You do the research, you find out there's 10 brothers here. And so each brother got two pieces of silver. So it's actually even worse than what we thought. So the brothers valued him at two shekels. Two cents, man. That's, that's how much they cared for their brother. That devaluing of Joseph did not shape his character. It didn't misshape his character. Joseph stripped of his garment. He's stripped of his freedom. He's stripped of his family. He's devalued by his brothers. And now he's about to become another man's possession. And despite all this, his character continues to grow in an upward trajectory. That's incredible. Now, if he can do that, you and I, equipped with the Spirit of God, living in our life in a way that was not available to Joseph, how much more can we grow 
and have our character in an upward trajectory no matter what is coming against our life. I want us to elevate. I want us to elevate our thinking beyond, well, this is who I am, to see, hey, I think God's calling me to another level. I believe he's not calling me to a level like step up and coast for a while. I think it's there's an upward trajectory that, that Paul talks about in the book of Philippians. It's this upward call that he's calling us into. And so they brought Joseph into Egypt, and the only thing that he takes with him from the pit, he, he moved from privilege to the pit. In the pit, he loses everything. And from the pit, he becomes another man's possession. And the only thing that he takes with him into Egypt is his character. But it's his character that's going to unlock his future. See, his dad worked with him. His mom and dad, man, they took him to church. They, they invested in his character in a time when it was easily shaped. And so his key has been cut so that when it's inserted in the lock, it's going to turn and it's going to open doors. His character is what's going to unlock his future. There's more tests to come, but we're going to see his character unlocks his future. Verse 29, Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments as a demonstration of grief. He returned to his brothers. You know, he was upset. The boy's not here. As for me, where am I to go? His, his plan was thwarted. He's not going to be able to play the hero. So they took Joseph's tunic, they slaughtered a male goat, dipped the tunic in the blood, and they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. It's interesting, they don't even call him their brother. They don't even call him by name. That's interesting because in Acts, the opposition to Jesus, they never call him Jesus. They call him that man or something like that. And he, Jacob, examined it and he said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes as a sign of grief and put on sackcloth on his loins, mourning clothes, rough garments, and mourned for his son for many days. And all his sons and his daughters rose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol, that's the place of the, the realm of the dead in the Hebrew cosmology. He says, I'm going to die mourning for my son. I'm never going to stop mourning for him, is what he's saying. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. You know, Jacob's father is led to believe that Joseph was killed and eaten by some kind of wild animal, like he was you know, mauled to death by a lion or a bear or a leopard or something. And think about that. Think about what that does to Jacob. Imagine how this makes Jacob feel. Not only is, is he deprived of his son, and his son is gone from his life. He, he didn't know that day that that was the last day he was going to see his son alive. And now jo Joseph is gone. And to think that he died in such a horrible way, imagine how that makes him feel. Imagine how, how it makes him feel knowing that he sent his son on this mission to look after the welfare of his brothers. He sent his son on that assignment. You know, if I hadn't sent Joseph out that day, he'd still be alive. This is my fault. Imagine what this does to Jacob. So the brothers, they don't just wrong Joseph, but they wrong their father. And it makes me wonder about the people that are walking around free here on this reservation that they have committed murder, or they know who has, they've done nothing about it, and the, the ripple effects of how that's affected other people and other families, and the exponential flow of grief, and the impact that that has, you see, you see how, how much it wrongs not just one person, but it wrongs an entire community. That's what happens here. These brothers, they don't just wrong Joseph. They wrong their father in a massive way. And I, I think eventually it starts to sink into them what they've done, but the story has gone so far, they can't walk away from it. They're going to take this lie, they're going to take this secret to their graves, or so they think. When they see what this does to their father, they, they, I, I believe that it makes the, uh, the brothers really regret what they did because of how it hurt their dad, but they can't walk it back. What's done is done. It's gone too far. And so they, they can't go back and undo it. 
And so they just continue to live out the lie in the meantime. But the reckoning will come later, and uh, there, there will be an accounting that will take place. So, meanwhile, the Midianites, they sold Joseph to uh, the, the captain of the bodyguard in Egypt, a guy by the name of Potiphar. And so in a very short time, Joseph's life changes radically from this place of privilege in his father's home to the pit where he loses everything. And now he's less than nothing because now he's the possession of another man. And so next week, we're going to look at how he fares as another man's possession. What kind of character will Joseph demonstrate as a slave? He, the only thing he took with him from father's home into the pit, into Potiphar's house as another man's possession, the only thing he takes with him is his character. Do you see why it's so important to prepare your children for the future? Because character will be tested. Are you preparing for your test? We're going to look at more of this next week as we get further into Joseph's story. Uh, what I want to do here is I, I want to show you seven more ways that Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ in this chapter. And you might have picked up on some of them here in this last part, but we've already showed seven ways, but let's show seven more ways that his life prophetically anticipated Jesus. Uh, number one, his brothers conspire and plot to put him to death, just like the religious establishment in Jerusalem did with Jesus. The idea to sell Joseph came from his brother Judah, which in the Greek form is Judas. It's interesting, the betrayer of Jesus was, he would have heard his name spoken, Yehuda, and, and his, his last name is, you know, Iscariot, Judas Iscariot. But it's not really a last name. It really is Ishkariot. Yehuda Ishkariot is Judah, the one or the man that's from the city. Because there was more than one Judah that was part of the 12. And so they, uh, you know, to distinguish them, they had this, uh, this little nickname for the other Judah. Interesting that uh, Judah was the one that says, hey, let's sell him. Let's, let's get some silver for this. And so Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The brothers here, they betray Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. It's not the same amount, Pastor. Yeah, but account for inflation, I think it's probably about equivalent. Both Jesus and Joseph are sold for silver. Uh, being put in the pit seems to typify Jesus' burial. And there was no water in the pit, which is interesting because Joseph would have gotten very thirsty in there. It's interesting. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. The pit was empty, just like Jesus, who was buried in a new tomb with no other bodies. A seventh way, I, noted, I, I told you to, to notice that from verse 18 onwards in this chapter, there's a shift that takes place. There's something very puzzling about this whole episode. I don't know if you realize it or not, but in the text... There's no record of Joseph speaking any word of defense or any word at all. He's like a lamb silent before his shearers, just like Jesus was, according to Isaiah 53, 7, Acts 8, 32, and also the gospel accounts at his trial. It frustrated Pilate that, that Jesus would not speak up to defend himself. Pilate knew he was innocent, says, hey, speak up, and, and Jesus yet would not do it. And uh, the more you look at it, the more you realize uh, there, there's, a, there's a parallel here. Now, I believe that Joseph did speak up, but it's been intentionally edited by the Holy Spirit to preserve this prophetic model, that Joseph's life is a model, a template of Jesus. So that's 14 ways altogether that we saw in this chapter that Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ, and we've only looked at one chapter of his life. So we're going to move on from here next week. We're not going to look at chapter 38 because it's like this sidebar uh, a parenthesis. It only focuses on Judah's life, an episode in Joseph's brother's life. It's kind of a sordid story. We're actually going to pick things up next week with Genesis chapter 39. But if Joseph can be a person of Christ-like character, if he can have Christ-like character developed in him thousands of years before Jesus becomes Jesus, comes to earth as Mary's boy, then how much more can we expect God to be able to produce that same Christ-like character in us who enjoy a measure of the Holy Spirit that was not available to Joseph back then? So we need to elevate. Let, let's, let's elevate our thinking a little bit here. We're never going to elevate our living until we elevate how we think. And we need to start getting rid of the excuses. We talked about that last week. 
But we need to lift up our eyes a little bit and say, hey, you know what? I believe that God wants to take me here. And it's an upward trajectory. I want to conclude things by asking a couple of questions. Again, I want these things to challenge us because if we just stay here and say, that was good, Pastor, but we don't move, we haven't accomplished anything. So question, am I allowing things to shape me on the inside that I shouldn't? I'm very careful about what I watch on TV, what movies I watch, what kind of voices I let speak into my life because that can shape our character. And I don't want my character to be shaped by worldly influences. So I'm very careful about that. I'm, ask yourself, am I allowing things to shape me that I shouldn't? Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind what influences do I need to cut out of my life right now? When things come up against my life, there's a challenge in my life, where does that leave my character? Okay, when there's a challenge that comes up against my life, financial crisis, sickness, problems at work, whatever. When opposition comes up against my life, where does that leave my character? What, where does my character go under pressure? That can be an indicator of where we need to make some adjustments. And how prepared for testing is my character? This is probably the biggest question. How prepared for testing is my character? Because character is going to be tested. Because God wants for him to be able to take your key, put it in that lock, and turn it. Are you letting God cut your key? Cut the key of your life. Cut the areas of your life so that when it's fit into that lock, it just turns effortlessly. There's things he wants to do in your life, but will you let him prepare you for it? How prepared for testing is your character? You don't prepare for the test at the test or during the test. You prepare for it in advance. So ask God to show you what areas of my life do I need to work on so that I am adequately prepared for testing when it comes. His character will be tested. You're going to be put into positions where maybe you lose everything, but the one thing you can't lose is your character. You can still take that with you from the pit to your next season. So when the challenge comes and maybe adversity really hammers your life, you might lose a lot, but you can still walk away with your character. And your character, if it's an intact, it will unlock your future. If I still got my character, no harm done. I know I'm going to be okay in that next season. Let's let God take us to that next level. Can we do that? Let's pray together. Let's ask God to, to show us where we need to make some changes. Father God, in the name of Jesus, right now, I just pray that you would bring to people's minds, the people watching this, bring to our minds where we need to make changes, where we need to make adjustments so that our character would be adequately prepared and shaped to be the person that you want us to be. When the test comes, God, we don't want the test to shape our character. We want to pass the test and take our character with us to the next season. So bring to our minds, what, where is our character being influenced and misshaped? So we can, we can make changes in there. What, what areas do I need to maybe shut off influences? Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts. Bring to our minds an awareness of where we need to make change and give us the courage to make those changes. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And if you agree with that, say, make it so for me, Lord. Amen. Well, may God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his goodness to rest upon your life. May he who is able to keep you from stumbling continue on an upward trajectory. As we grow to be more and more like Jesus, may he be with you this week, and we'll see you back here next time. God bless, and we'll see you soon.